Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's session. Um, I want to begin by saying thank you to the sponsor, Valley Queen Cheese. Uh, thank you for uh, supporting the organization. I will say, on a personal level, I have fond memories of your group. Back when I was in South Dakota in 2002, working on a campaign, I needed a break one day. So I drove up north to Millbank and met with Max and had a great afternoon, just catching up and relaxing before I had to go back down to Sioux Falls and work on a campaign, which I don't think I'll ever go back out and work in the field on a campaign again. Um, but thank you for your support. You know, today's session, um, the election is over, now what? I think is a, a great segue from what occurred just before us with Sarah Wyan's panel. And Sarah, if you're on, what a great job that was. Um, and before we jump into our speaker, we'll just offer up who I am. I am uh, Michael Torrey with Michael Torrey Associates and I and Cassandra Cabal are located in Washington, DC and work on your behalf on federal issues. And please know how very much we appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, let's just get into this. And I'm gonna begin by introducing um, somebody who um, I've had a long-term relationship with and has just done so well in life. And that's gonna be our speaker, uh, Ray Starling. Ray is a farm kid from North Carolina and he went kind of the typical route. He was a ag ed major. And for those of you familiar with the organization, he was a national FFA officer, got his law degree was the general counsel for the North Carolina Department of Ag and then thought, hey, why not go to the big city? So he moved up to Washington, D.C., started working for Senator Tom Tillis and quickly rose through the ranks to become the chief of staff. And in 2016, I was working, uh, helping pull together the transition team for USDA and Ray called advocating for somebody he thought would be great. And I remember saying, Ray, you have no idea how many people are calling me, telling me that you should come into the administration. And he did, and we were all very fortunate uh, because of that. Ray began at the White House as the Ag Advisor to the President under the umbrella of the National Economic Council. And then his talents were quickly recognized and he was moved over to USDA to be the Chief of Staff for Secretary of Ag, Sonny Perdue. Uh, Ray's smarter than me, as you will see, because he had the good sense to say, you know what, I've been to the city long enough, it's time to head home back down to North Carolina, which he did. And he now serves as the General Counsel for the North Carolina Chamber, and he's also the President for their uh, the Legal Institute of the North Carolina uh, Chamber's Foundation. So he has been, front and center and had many seats that have seen the policy making process and the political side for the issues that we all deal with every day. And I will say that there's a, a lot of us in DC that someday hope to see Ray back up in Washington with the word honorable in front of his name. Uh, I don't know if that'll happen, but I tell you what, he left quite an impression in DC. So Ray Starling is gonna walk through uh, the title and talk about some of the issues that we're facing and then we're gonna move to a Q&A I'm going to be moderating that. So if you have questions, feed those in and I will work to pull them together. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Thanks for joining us. Ray Starling. Michael, thank you so much uh, for the kind words. Uh, I'm not sure that saying you want me back in DC with honorable in front of my name though, I'm not sure that's a part of the kind words. That, uh, that sounds more like a sentence than an opportunity. Uh, you all should know because uh, Michael works on your behalf. Uh, that the Aggie community in Washington is actually pretty close. And over a few years, you kind of get to know all the players. And in the course of that, there are a few that stand out as, and you will get this reference, the cream of the crop. Uh, Michael Torrey, uh, Cassandra, his colleague there at Torrey and Associates, they are among that elite group. And so uh, an honor to be a part of the meeting and have Michael introduce me. To the EDGE membership and the others in attendance, Thanks also to you for having me here and including this topic on your agenda. It is obviously well-timed given the events of yesterday. And, you know, we're in this new environment. You know, there's gotta be the ubiquitous comment about uh, us being online. You know, as your speaker, I would normally be really energetic and moving about behind the podium. Uh, but here, I think the best thing for us to do for the next few minutes is to just talk. 
Uh, I want to start where I always do with groups like this, and that is to begin with a few words of gratitude about what you do every day. And to some extent, I, I don't speak to a lot of dairy connected audiences, but I would tell you to, to, much, to, to much extent, uh, you in particular embody uh, the work ethic and the wholesomeness of American agriculture and America in general. Uh, nobody does that better, I think, than the folks involved in the dairy industry. And so uh, a couple of words to you as I start, uh, quotes, if you will, that sum up my impressions of what your contribution to our country actually means. I think we're such a blessed nation that not many people understand exactly what it takes for the 1% or the less than 1%. Uh, and by that, I mean our farmers, not the elite 1% that you sometimes hear about in the media. I think folks kind of gloss over how difficult it is for that group to actually put their livelihoods, uh, their financial situation, and in many cases, uh, even their time with family and their time in their community at risk to be able to feed the rest of the world. There are a couple of quotes that I think summarize this sentiment and the first is one that I actually had never heard until I heard Secretary Perdue uh, say it and he, when he first became secretary, he would attribute it to the Chinese. He would say there's an old Chinese proverb. Uh, and then of course we got into the trade skirmishes with the Chinese and he quit giving them any credit for the proverb. So I don't really know if it's a Chinese proverb or not, but I'm gonna call it a sunny proverb uh, here this morning. And he, he's fond of saying in front of audiences all around the country, and I quote, when man has no food, he has one problem. When man has plenty to eat, he has many problems. I think that summarizes how lucky we are to have the food supply, the safe, abundant, affordable food supply that we have here in the United States. Trust me, nobody in a country uh, with insufficient agriculture is having a debate right now about organic versus vegan versus GMO free versus sustainable versus humane, local, pasture raised, grass fed, uh, folks in countries that only have one problem, food security, are not talking about the latest paleo diet, uh, the latest keto diet, uh, or even the one that I tried to invent over Christmas, the Cairo diet, which consists of mostly eating pecan pie, and it is pecan, not pecan pie, uh, all through the holidays. So remember, uh, we are fortunate to have many problems and not just that one, and I attribute that to you those folks in the dairy industry. So thank you for what you do uh, to contribute to our food supply in the country. The other quote is from a gentleman by the name of Williams Jennings Bryan. He ran for president against Wim McKinley back in 1896. Uh, he was from Nebraska. And you'll find this interesting. Part of his platform was actually to try to appeal to rural voters and rural interests uh, and to enact policies that were more favorable to farmers, particularly in the monetary environment in the United States at that time. He's considered to be one of the greatest orators in American political history. And I want you to think about that a minute. I mean, if you studied political science, chances are you would read some of Williams Jennings Bryan's speeches and his comments and his writings. That puts him in a very elite group of people to say he's one of the greatest orators in American political history. I mean, think about that group. You got Lincoln, Douglas, Williams Jennings Bryan, JFK, Dennis Rodman. I mean, the list goes on and on. Of course, I'm joking about Mr. Rodman. It's hard to not be able to see you and know whether you're laughing or whether you're thinking, gosh, is this guy really serious? Uh, but in what's widely recounted as one of the best political speeches in our young nation's history, Mr. Bryan said the following, burn down your cities and leave our farms and our cities will spring up again as if by magic, but destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. Let me say it again, burn down your cities and leave our farms and your cities will spring up again as if by magic, but destroy our farms and the grass will grow in the streets of every city in the country. It's a good quote. Unfortunately, Mr. Bryan actually lost the election he lost several elections to be president of the United States. And I think we can attribute that to the fact that he did not condense that quote to 140 characters and tweet it, if he had only known. 
Well, beyond expressing my affinity and gratitude for what you do and the difference you make in contributing to our food supply, I want to add a little bit to what Michael shared about my background and my experience in ag policy. In other words, I want to answer the question that you may be asking yourself right now, which is, why exactly should us folks out here be listening to this guy that talks funny from North Carolina? Well, I did just return home after uh, several years in Washington. That doesn't make me unique. You've got connections with dozens of people that have gone and done the DC thing and then come back home. You've got connections with folks like Michael that have done the DC thing and stayed in DC, even though their roots are out in rural America. But in the short time I was up in DC, I actually went up mid-career, which I think made a difference. It actually made it harder personally, uh, but gave me a chance to be at a little bit different level. Uh, as he mentioned, I was the chief of staff for United States Senator that was on the Ag Committee and Judiciary Committee. I was the principal ag advisor to the President of the United States at the White House, and I spent a year as Secretary Purdue's chief of staff over at USDA, uh, the secretary who I believe was the best cabinet secretary in the entire administration. Now, some of you may be saying, wow, this guy really had a hard time keeping a job, and, and perhaps you'd be right about that, but I consider all of those to be a part of one career largely focused on agriculture policy. I would also point out that I lasted longer than Mr. Scaramucci. In fact, those of us that worked at the White House, we measured our time there in Scaramucci's, and I think I made it to like 54 Scaramucci's, so that's saying something. And I do indeed have some stories I can tell. I uh, may have to come back some other time to share some of them, but uh, I have a few stories I definitely can't tell, uh, or at least that I shouldn't. Had a chance to ride in the presidential motorcade, to help write executive orders and proclamations, to fly on Air Force One with the president multiple times. We got to skip the security lines at the airport when we were traveling with the secretary. I had numerous meetings over my time at the White House and at USDA that were in the Situation Room. Uh, and I even got to ride around in a Suburban that was armored down in Mexico City for business we were doing down there. And I've just got to tell you, if you ever visit a foreign capital that you're not familiar with, Getting a ride from the U.S. State Department in an armored suburban is a pretty good way to go. Uh, but at the end of my tenure, I held not only a top secret security clearance, but a secure compartmentalized security clearance. Uh, and that covers information for which code words can only be used to describe it. And now you know why when my wife catches me in the kitchen at night eating milk and cookies and says, what are you doing? I say, well, I'm engaging in a covert operation that I'd like to just call Operation Moo Moo Dipper. Um, and so, uh, I, to be honest and to be humble, uh, code word usage was certainly not a part of my daily or even my weekly routine. Uh, but all of those things were attractive and fun to do and gave me a chance to feel like I was really contributing to the ag policy conversation. But to do all those things uh, and to do that kind of work in the nation's capital, that meant I had to live there. Uh, and over time, at some point, I decided there was no gig in that city with enough allure uh, to keep me away from being closer to my folks and my family back down here on the farm. Uh, so now I'm in a career that allows me to focus on the big picture of ag policy, the big picture of ag economics, and even the big picture of our relationship as an industry vis-a-vis uh, -vis our consumers. And those are some of the things I want to talk about uh, today. I heard a guy say one time about politics that it's really a pretty simple thing to figure out. He says, just sound out the word, poly and ticks. Poly means many, and ticks means little blood suckers. If you put them together, you know what you need to know about Washington. So as you can see, with that kind of joke, it's actually pretty easy to get cynical uh, about what happens in Washington, or more accurately, what doesn't uh, actually happen in, in Washington. And that's why I admire people like Michael and Cassandra uh, who are engaged there on your behalf, uh, who consistently are in the ring making contributions to the policy debate at the national level. What I've been asked to do this morning before we take a couple of questions is to address the key things in the ag policy world that I believe should be front and center on your radar in this new environment. I refer to this list sometimes as the list of, quote, things that keep me up at night uh, or things to watch. Uh, but it could also be described as getting a lay of the land for the things confronting our industry over the next few years. Let me begin with a basic economic observation. Trust me, I don't intend to rival the real economist that you're working with throughout the conference and in your industry. Uh, consider this to be sort of a country lawyer economic observation. And I call it ag's fiscal cliff. Uh, some of the edge, no pun intended, some of the edge has been taken off of that cliff 
uh, and because of our rebounding commodity prices over the last few months. But I want to acknowledge for just a few minutes the sheer volume and quantity of assistance provided by the federal government to agriculture over the last few years. We're coming out of a year in which federal payments to farmers reached the highest level in American history. Forbes magazine published a statistic just a few days ago that said more than 36% of farmer income in 2020 was actually from government payments. Bill Lapp in an article for the Financial Times says that ever rising dependence on federal price, excuse me, on federal support in a low price environment is highly problematic for the farm sector. He went on to say that U.S. agriculture has been painted in a corner where the government payments keep rising, production also keeps rising, and prices remain weak. I think he would take some of the edge off of that third observation now, given the price situation we're finding ourselves in. But he concluded by saying a solution to this problem is not readily apparent. That was a few months ago. Again, I think the, the stats have improved a little bit in terms of the market prices. But if prices return to their mid-2020 levels or before, uh, there's not a lot of data to suggest that they won't. Uh, once some of the buying preferences and some of the depression on production uh, perhaps subside, then I think that we're going to be concerned again about farm profitability in the absence of government support. It's, it's worth noting that for all of agriculture, for all of agriculture, non-farm bill payments actually outnumbered farm bill payments in 2020. If you put the two together, we're at some figure of ag assistance that's greater than $40 billion. And that frankly doesn't even capture the funding related to food purchases where the farmer was not the direct recipient of those dollars, but a third party was, and that money was used to provide nutrition to folks who needed it most. It's probably appropriate that I pause here and make sure I'm clear. I'm not here to state that the public assistance afforded in the ag community was not money well spent. Farmers and a stable food supply are a critical part of our national security. And many farmers and farm operations were disrupted by everything from the trade situation to most certainly the COVID situation. My point is though, if we don't talk about this amongst ourselves openly and honestly, we may not be prepared for what's on the other side of it. I think we've got to understand and agree and acknowledge that the volume or the sheer quantity is in fact staggering. To put it in some perspective, the entire annual budget of NASA is just over $22 billion and USDA doled out twice that amount just last year. Think back to the 2008 and the 2009 um, financial crisis when we all belly ached about the auto industry bailout. Overall, that entire bailout only cost taxpayers about $20 billion. The initial bailout was about 80 billion, about 60 of that came back into the federal treasury. And that amount that was left, the amount that actually went out of the door and didn't come back is less than half of what our farmers across the country received last year. So again, I'm not here to suggest that this support should have never been provided. I'm merely suggesting that we've got to ponder as folks in the ag space about what happens when it no longer exists or when it's redirected in some way. And I pause there on that notion of those dollars being redirected. Uh, based on the criticism that was lobbed at the Trump administration over how the funds actually went out the door, you can bet that the administration that came into power yesterday uh, will likely or, or would have likely uh, handled things differently and will handle them differently when given the chance. Perhaps more conditions on that money, perhaps a focus on directing that money to smaller farmers, uh, smaller farms or those in historically socially disadvantaged classes. Uh, but to sum it up, my point here there is that neither side really seems to be talking about how to deal with the end of that aid. They most seem to be pointing at each other and saying, well, I don't think you're doing it right. Uh, as we look at this next groundwork, this $2 trillion package that President Biden is proposing, the COVID aid, as we look at the next round of tax policy that's liable to come down the pike, and of course, if we look at the next farm bill, we're going to have to brace for a realistic discussion about whether the permanent and the ad hoc safety nets for the farm economy can actually keep up. Imagine having this conversation in the context of a farm bill that is more of a food bill than it is a farm bill, which is quite likely what the setting will be unless the levers of leadership change between now and 2023. 
if nothing else, the assistance policies that we've experienced over the last couple of years, blessed, I would say, uh, and point this out, by both parties in Congress. I mean, everyone has fingerprints on it at this point. That seems to be, that volume of money seems to at least be a tacit admission that the Farm Bill safety net is not functioning uh, sufficiently and that it actually needs to be drastically revisited. Just how that works out is going to be determined by how well you can tell your story and stay engaged in Washington. Uh, but I want to flag that first point. I think our economics and agriculture are going to be challenged as we wean ourselves off of the volume of federal assistance that we've received over the last two or three years. I'm going to move to the second keep me up at night point observation, and that relates to litigation risks around agriculture. I had a chance to visit with the National Pork Producers recently about this topic, and I used a phrase there uh, talking to that group about legal threats. I said it's a little bit like warning a hound dog about ticks. The pork industry and even the dairy industry too already know that litigation risk and litigation costs are a factor. Looking at this issue is a lot of what I do at the Chamber Legal Institute in North Carolina and in collaboration with the U.S. Chamber Legal Institute of, or the Institute for Legal Reform at the U.S. Chamber up in Washington. That threat, I think, is not even the right word anymore because it's not a threat. It's a reality. It's a state of being that uh, lawyers are more and more looking to agriculture to pounce and create causes of action that potentially put money in their and their clients' pockets. I thought long and hard about the best way to describe this challenge, and I hope you can follow my illustration uh, despite you being many miles from either one of the oceans. Uh, I'm a beach guy. I'm not sure, I'm, I'm positive that if you could see me better, you would agree that I have a highly refined beach body that comes from drinking a lot of milk. Uh, the kind of body that only the whales would envy, uh, but I do love being at the beach. And one of the great things about the beach is you look around when you're on the beach, you're a little bit self-conscious, and then you realize nobody really cares. So being a beach guy, I'm aware and I watch the shoreline sort of change from day to day. You know that that shoreline never ends up in exactly the same place. The sands are always shifting. It's always being added to or it's always being eaten away by the waves. I feel like in the ag litigation world, and in particular in the animal ag litigation world, we occasionally get a few waves working for us, but the other side seems to always have the undertow, that force that continues to erode at the shoreline even when we can't see it. And if you've been to the beach or you've been out in the water when there's a strong undertow, you know that that undertow is far more powerful and far more effective in shaping the shoreline than the waves are. I hope there's some developing consensus in the agriculture world that we need to work together to address what seems like a real imbalance in our ability to survive this. I'm not here to scare or depress you, but I actually just think this trend is barely getting started. In my home state, it's litigation against hog farmers because of odors, uh, odors that are frankly innate to livestock production. I'm pretty sure dairy farms deal with some of those same smells. In our courtrooms or in other courtrooms, it's unfounded claims that cancer is absolutely from certain ag chemicals that have been applied over time, notwithstanding plenty of science and data to show the otherwise. My point here is that the only limit to the list of ways in which this risk could ultimately reshape our industry is whatever limits there are in the plaintiff's lawyer's minds. When I use that wave versus undertow uh, illustration, I want you to understand that it's based on the fact, the fact that lawsuits brought against farmers and agribusinesses are often the last step in a very well-planned and executed strategy to extract money or some other sort of concession, sometimes about the way we raise animals from the people that grow our food. We're not just up against the lawyers on the other side, folks. We're up against an entire apparatus that exist to support those lawyers and to drive social conversations that dictate outcomes in legal cases. It is not organic. It is not grassroots. It is in fact contrived. It is sophisticated. It is organized and it is well-funded. The media presence, the free help that the other side gets from nonprofits and foundations looking to do good work, the tactical work that they do to paint 
the scene to the public on the outside of the courtroom while our lawyers are inside busy arguing evidentiary motions and trying to make sure their evidence can get into the record. Those who follow jury arguments over the course of the last 30 years tell me that 30 years ago, a plaintiff's lawyer to the uh, a plaintiff's lawyer's plea to the jurors was often about sympathy, feeling sorry for, or trying to feel empathy toward a plaintiff. Fast forward to today, and with millennials now sitting on jurors, it's the appeal is not about sympathy for the plaintiff. The appeal is about anger at the defendant about addressing and quote, injustice in the system and asking that juror to quote, be brave or to help right a wrong. There's just no denying that the investment and the effort that's being focused on suing agricultural interest absolutely dwarfs the investment that we are making to defend against that. This very day, there are entire organizations, I could point you to web pages with resources that spell out how federal law and state law can be used to shut down farms and attack agriculture in the courts. So why does this matter? And what are the implications? Well, whether you're a dairy farmer, a Roundup user, or an applicator, or just an Aggie trying to adopt the latest technology that you've been told is what will help you be more competitive, beware that someone is thinking day in and day out about how to get you to change your behavior through the court system. Take it from a lawyer who's more proud to be the son of a farmer, a hog farmer, by the way, than he is to be a lawyer. Forget biting the hand that feeds us. There are folks who in, whose entire personal and professional mission is to sue the hand that has fed them. My question to this group would be whether we can build some of that infrastructure on our side, that institutional infrastructure that would allow our voices to create more of an undertow as opposed to just having to ride the waves in litigation. Now, admittedly, not all of you will agree with me on this, that this is a real threat and something we should spend time uh, talking about. It reminds me of a quote from a gentleman by the name of Brant Hansen. Uh, he wrote this about one of his own points of view. He said, I get the idea that a lot of people think this idea is stupid and they don't agree with me on it. And then he pauses and says, and I get that sense because a lot of people tell me that idea is stupid and I don't agree with you on it. Well, hopefully you don't think that paying attention to this force that I think can really reshape our industry over the next couple of decades. I hope you don't have that reaction. Uh, the seed that I wanted to plant here with the second point is that we need to get serious about counterbalancing some of those structural features on the other side. Uh, some of the leverage that the other side seems to have and be able to use against us. Perhaps, and this is where I'll close this second point, I think this is about the most important thing I could say about this issue. It's not just about protecting our pocketbooks. It's not just about protecting our investments or about guarding our piggy banks. In my view, litigation against agriculture has the potential to fundamentally reshape our sector in a way that actually makes us less productive in the long run. So much less productive, in fact, that the effect would ultimately be that we end up denying nutritious food to folks who really need it. So I believe we not only have a financial in system, uh, excuse me, a financial incentive to figure this out and have, figure out how to push back against this, but I think it's a moral one. Uh, I told you there were three observations and we're through two of them already. The first was about ag's fiscal cliff. The second has been about the risk posed to agriculture in the ag space, or excuse me, the risk posed by litigation in the ag space. And the third is actually best set up by a story that I want to share with you about my time as Secretary of Purdue's Chief of Staff. Back at the end of 2018, after the United States House flipped from Republican to Democrat, so this would have been post the November 2018 elections and toward the beginning of 2019, uh, it was clear that the Ag Committee chairman was no longer going to be Texan Mike Conaway because he was a Republican, uh, but that he would pass the gavel back over to Chairman Colin Peterson uh, from Minnesota. And we at USDA had to think about our relationship with Chairman Peterson. He was technically on the other side of the aisle. And so we scheduled a meeting between the new Chairman Peterson uh, and Secretary Purdue. 
And when you schedule a meeting between a cabinet secretary and the highest ranking officer in one of the bodies when it comes to your policy area, you don't just call, set up the meeting and go be bopping down to the Capitol. We had prep sessions. We prepared papers with bulleted lists of items that we wanted to talk about. I smile about it because when I get to the story, you're going to understand why all that was a complete and total waste of time. We actually prepped the secretary and did Q&A and put him on the spot and made him have to answer lots of different questions. And uh, then we went to the meeting. And boy, did I think we were something. We left the US Department of Ag. We rode down, uh, I don't believe it was Constitution. But, well, maybe it was, because it's one way. We rode down Constitution Avenue, circled the Capitol. And here we go out of our armored Suburbans in the meet with the chairman of the Ag Committee. And at the end of the day, the secretary and the chairman sat in the chairman's office and talked about duck hunting the entire time. I remember getting back in the Suburban with the secretary to go back to USDA and the secretary turning to me and saying, well, how do you think that went? I couldn't help myself and my youth and my zeal. I said, oh, you mean the part about where you didn't talk about anything that we had prepared to talk about and where you didn't really get any answers to the questions that we were hoping to get answers on from Chairman Peterson. Uh, but Secretary Purdue, patient as he was, was teaching me a valuable lesson. And that was that even for cabinet secretaries and for House Committee Chairman, it's in Washington, it's still about relationships. And that lays some groundwork for what will be needed from the ag community and the new administration over the next four years. And I make this next statement as a former Trump staffer, uh, there simply is no denying that Joe Biden is our president and that Tom Vilsack is going to be, or hopefully going to be, uh, our Secretary of Agriculture again, and I'm certainly pulling for their success. With that said, I feel like I'd be doing you a disservice uh, if I didn't say a little bit more about the new political reality that was formalized just yesterday. Frankly, I work not just with the agribusiness community, but with the business community at large, and I don't quite think we're braced for the conversation as much as we need to be. I want to mention a few themes that I believe we will need to navigate in the next few years and to some degree in the very next few weeks and months. First, President Biden has made no mystery of the fact that he intends to address climate change in ways that were drastically different from his predecessor. I think many of us in ag are trying to look at this optimistically with a hope that agriculture can be uh, in a position to take advantage of some of the green economy efforts and goals that the president and his team have in mind. And hopefully there will be some wins for agriculture there. I believe that the individuals the president has named to key roles at USDA and elsewhere in his administration, both for the long term and for just the next few weeks working on the transition, I think they're competent individuals who are serious about this effort. I think they'll use every tool at their disposal to advocate for lowering the carbon footprint, not just of our country in general, but also of agriculture. What they'll be quick to say is that there are gonna be opportunities on the crop side to sequester carbon, and there may be opportunities for income for some farmers. And again, that will likely involve some incentives and, and hopefully even some money, right, to go into the farmer's pocket. But what I believe perhaps we're not as prepared for is the other side of that coin that the proposals won't all be carrot based. There will undoubtedly be some sticks and those sticks will sometime and probably to a large degree be livestock and dairy focused. It's too early to tell exactly what they will be, but if history is any sort of indicator, I would expect a myriad of activities early on focused on cataloging and raising awareness of production practices that ultimately emit carbon into the atmosphere with an eye toward eventually requiring some sort of offset for them. The peripheral pain here, the pain off to the side, is that this will increase the volume of the conversation about what Americans eat. You didn't hear this much for the last four years. The last administration did not play the role of food police very much. I think that's gonna change. And not only will we return to a louder conversation about nutrition, it will now have a climate implications trend that is too obvious to ignore. Another focus that this administration has clearly identified is a focus on socially disadvantaged, minority and small farmers. Now you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who says that this is a bad idea, particularly given that we need farmers from all walks of life 
and that our profession should be one in which folks of any background can succeed if they work at it. I think the only concern here is that none of the support for these programs be redistributed from things that are already working in terms of farm support efforts. We should be able to do both. We should be able to support larger farms and larger farming operations while at the same time looking out for those that are just coming into the industry or that perhaps have been harmed by some of the things that we've done in the past. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a return to a focus on inse food insecurity. And of course, taking office in the middle of COVID when many hourly and entry level jobs in food service and hosp hospitality have basically disappeared, there's a heightened need for continued conversations around food security and around this topic. You can expect the department to take a hard look at policies and regulations that were adopted during the Trump era that cracked down on SNAP dependency and that were focused on administering those programs as narrowly as could be administered under Congress's authorization. It's going to be different. Don't expect to hear the mention of farmers as frequently. Don't expect to see farmers in the Roosevelt Room at the White House talking with the president. Yeah, some of the words are going to be the same. Infrastructure, economic activity and recovery, increased trade, but the patina on those underlying efforts will be different. It will be infrastructure with a focus on renewable energy. It'll be trade conversations, but with a increased focus on multilateral action and less volume around tariffs and penalties. It will be about economic recovery, but with a staggering safety net tab as we've already started to hear from some of the president's nominees and appointees, uh, swatting away questions about price tags and saying, hey, we've got low interest rates. We don't need to worry about that at the moment. I'll leave that up to you to decide, but perhaps uh, not as much focus in the coming years on pure farmer profitability as a focus on using agriculture to effectuate other outcomes, climate, food security, environmental changes, or even nutritional objectives and goals. But in good faith, I think we as a community have to leverage the relationships, just like Secretary Perdue did, to have conversations that we need to have over the coming months. I just want to make it clear, and again, I think I would be doing you a disservice uh, if I didn't make clear that those conversations are going to have a different tinge than they have for the last four years. I'll close with two stories. Uh, one relates to the first time I ever walked into the Oval Office to brief the President of the United States. It was in February of 2017, and my job was to give the President a little bit of a lay of the land of what the agriculture community hoped to see uh, from the administration. Now, understand that notwithstanding what you might have seen in the media or read in the paper, generally speaking, you didn't just bebop in to talk with the President. Obviously, there's security, but there's also what I call policy security. There were these uh, steps that you had to go through before you could give the president your set of slides. So uh, I was very nervous, of course, about briefing the president. I go in, sit down. He's sitting in a little a big desk that we call the Resolute Desk, uh, which was a gift from Queen Elizabeth many years ago uh, because we helped rescue the uh, Resolute Icebreaker uh, for the British Navy and returned it to them. And we got a desk out of the deal that now sits in the Oval Office. It's the very desk that Joe Biden signed those executive orders at yesterday. I'm sitting on the front side of it. The president's, of course, sitting behind the desk. And I notice over on the side of his desk, there's a little wooden box that's about the size of a brick. And right in the middle of it, it has a red button on one side and a presidential seal on the other side. As I was briefing the president, I thought I was doing a great job. He was paying attention. He was nodding every now and then. I felt like I was really getting through, doing a good job. And all of a sudden, the president picked his finger up about head high. You know, that president didn't do anything if he didn't do it dramatically. And he pushed that little red button on that box on his desk. Now, folks, I got to tell you, I grew up in the Cold War. And red buttons and things like that on phones, they brought back memories of what might have just happened when the president hit that red button. I have to admit that one thing that went through my mind was, oh my goodness, who did we just blow up? And what did I say? Is it actually my fault? But to my surprise, over my right shoulder, coming through a door that came into the Oval that I didn't even know was a door. It's so cut into the wall of the Oval Office 
came this gentleman with a silver platter with a glass that had a presidential seal on it with ice in it and beside it was a diet coke bottle he walked over and stood behind the president steadied himself for a moment and then he set the ice down on the president's coaster and he poured a diet coke over the ice for the president see it turns out that the president of the united states both the one that just left office and the one that just came in the office and two or three presidents before them have a diet coke button on their desk now really it's for more than that right they can call their aide they can call and get something if they need someone to grab something for them but i did go home that night and i have to admit that the first thing i told my wife about was the diet coke button and feeling particularly bold about having been in the Oval Office and had an opportunity to talk to the president, I said to my wife, I said, you know, it might not be a bad idea if over beside my chair, we got one. And she cut me off halfway through, you know what was coming. I don't get to have a Diet Coke button uh, at my house. And folks, there's no easy button in agriculture. All of these things that I've talked about are complex and difficult, and it's gonna take all of us working together across party lines to try to solve some of these problems. And at the end of the day, we're just going to have to do the best we can and see where we leave it. In fact, in mentioning leaving it and when I left Washington, D.C., I started a little company called Short Rose Leadership. That's the capacity I'm speaking to you in today. It's a little consulting company or speaking company. And I chose that name Short Rose uh, Leadership very intentionally. Uh, if you're from North Carolina, you know that our fields are very uneven. We don't have very square fields. There's a lot of water around here, a lot of topographical change. And so we often have triangular fields or uh, trapezoidal fields or whatever you want to call them that are not exactly squared off. In fact, I'm pretty jealous of those folks out west that can farm 660 acres, all with straight lines uh, and, and 90 degree turns at the end. Uh, but since our fields are not symmetrical, you have to always decide when you go into them, which side of the field will you start on? And nobody ever pulled me aside and said this, but what I learned growing up on the farm is that you always start on the long side of the field. And then as you move across the field and it starts to become evening, it feels like the work starts to get a little faster on that shorter side because you're turning around a little more quickly. And there's just something special about getting over into those short rows. And I think farmers identify with that. I think farmers that have plowed both the long rows and the short rows and looked back across the field, there's a certain feeling that comes across you. You're tired, but you're proud. You might even get a little burst of energy as you're finishing things up there in the short rows of your field. You might be disappointed you didn't get finished faster because there's probably another field waiting for you, but you're happy that the work is now winding down. And you're aware that when the short rows are done, you're gonna get to go home. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that about preaches itself. Uh, the, this last little inspirational piece of my talk is just designed to ask you to take a time out every now and then, take a second, hit the pause button. And as you sit this day thinking about your advocacy, thinking about the new situation that Michael is helping you navigate in Washington, DC, you ought to also reflect on your own life, your latest venture, uh, or even your closest friendships and relationships, knowing that at some point we're all gonna be in those short roads. And we want to look back and be able to be proud of what we've done. With that, I'm in the short rows of this chat. I appreciate you. I appreciate uh, the significance of what you do. And I look forward to chatting with Michael about some of his thoughts, reflections on this, and any questions. Michael, thank you. Ray, thank you. Well done. I'm sure all of you can appreciate it's a different environment when doing this online. And we, in fact, can't see your faces. But the one thing that I would love to see is your questions and i know this group pretty well ray they got a lot of views so i've got a little box over here to the left and you'll see me looking that way now and then as your questions come in hey great conversation thanks again for being with us today um you know when you were going through litigation um i don't know that i can connect the two but i'm going to try because that comes down to in part some of the actions that may be expected in the new administration which in part will tie in to the people that they're going to have in place to help administer and implement the policies of the Biden administration. Would you, Ray, take a second and maybe talk about a few of the personnel announcements that we've already become uh, aware of, maybe beginning with Phil Sack, but also I know that you are friends with the new EPA administrator uh, who's been nominated for that position. So just a second to walk through a few of those folks. 
Yeah. I, I, first of all, thanks for that question. I think it's um, I think it's really apropos to what we're talking about. And I think you make a good point. I know that some of the presentations have been what can we expect in Congress? And you and I may even touch on that. But I think, quite frankly, uh, paying too much attention to what's actually happening on the Hill is taking our eye off the ball. Uh, both previous administrations, the Obama administration and the Trump administration, absolutely maximized the effect of the administrative state. Uh, in fact, Trump was known for loving executive orders. He said, you know, he didn't have to work with anybody on those. He could issue his executive orders. And just as of yesterday, 10 new executive orders on day one. So I think that phone and pen capability that the administration has, we're going to continue to see that play an outsized role in terms of impacting and influence in our industry. You asked specifically about two or three different uh, groups, agencies, and the staffing there. You know, I think for agriculture, we really should be grateful. Uh, the Secretary Bilsack is returning to USDA. I mean, this is obviously something the gentleman didn't need to do. Uh, if you know what he was doing, working, in fact, promoting dairy internationally, uh, he certainly took a major pay cut to come back into government. Uh, but he's a guy that's approachable. Uh, he's solid. He understands the nuts and bolts of how the department work. And to some degree, if you don't like his agenda, uh, that's actually problematic because he knows where, uh, you know, he, he knows how to get things done. And I think people like Michael will find him accessible and will we'll recognize many faces there. And I think that gives us some good comfort. But I'm fond of saying, Michael, that in agriculture, our the shape, the, the things that are going to reshape our industry the most in the coming year probably won't actually come out of USDA. They'll come out of EPA and to some extent FDA. Uh, North Carolina's uh, environmental regulator uh, has been tapped to be President Biden's administrator of the EPA, the top political appointee at EPA. Mr. Reagan is familiar with some of those struggles that we've had in North Carolina agriculture. I would tell you he's also accessible. He is a good human being. Uh, but again, I'd be remiss and I think I would be misleading you if I didn't tell you. Obviously, those policies that he is going to push are going to have a leftward bent. The other challenge I think that Secretary or Administrator rather Reagan is going to have, Michael, is all these other folks that are involved in the climate change conversation, the folks at the White House, the climate czar, uh, the National Environmental Policy Act folks, uh, uh, you know, all the folks that are on the Domestic Policy Council or the Economic uh, Council that I was a part of, I think they're going to have as much influence on that environmental agenda as the administrator himself. So I think we've got to watch out for that. And then last, you know, been very disappointed and what we saw out of FDA over the course of the last few days. Uh, I think you saw that there was a MOU at the last minute um, that essentially gave USDA or delegated to USDA some of the animal biotechnology uh, approval authority that had traditionally been over at FDA. Uh, the truth of the matter is this is a problem that Congress uh, needs to act on and never can seem to get its act together. Uh, but you, you saw FDA officials, both incoming and outgoing, uh, pitch a little tantrum about that and even insult the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the process. And uh, so that's disappointing. And, and that probably tells us a little bit about what we can expect out of those regulators over in that part, over in that agency. You know, Ray, you talked about food insecurity and it wasn't lost on me that the first announcements of the individuals that were going to be joining USDA were in the Food Nutrition Consumer Services Division. And I think that that was probably intentional uh, to make sure that those on the outside understood that. Um, as a side note, um, there's been other staff announcements made today that are coming from you know traditional uh, groups that agriculture has had to find new ways to work with going towards the comments that you made on litigation. So a lot more to unfold there. You know, let's talk about um, Congress for just a second. As you sit back in North Carolina with your background, what do you think Congress is actually going to achieve in the first six months? Well, I, I, you know, I do think there's a little bit of a honeymoon uh, coming in with uh, President Biden. Uh, I think COVID helps. I think he can take a page from uh, the, you know, President Obama's page book, you never waste a crisis. Uh, I do think the low interest rate environment means that we're going to see more federal government borrowing. We're obviously going to pay a price tag for uh, some additional aid. But I would have to say after that, Michael, I'm not as optimistic, uh, and, and maybe I am optimistic, that I, I, do, I just don't think all of a sudden overnight Congress is going to become remarkably more functional than it has been even under unified government. 
of course, one thing that your opinion would actually be better than mine, given your history and working there, uh, you know, it, it will depend a great degree in terms of how the Senate decides that it's going to govern itself. Uh, if it decides to depart from the precedent of 60 votes uh, being required to move a piece of legislation to the floor outside uh, of the executive appointment uh, process and outside of the reconciliation process, which is certainly being discussed, uh, then yeah, there's a potential. Uh, but I, but even in that environment, uh, and I think this is probably a lesson that we all need to keep in mind, whether Republican, Democrat, independent, unaffiliated, or Green Party, whatever you want to call it, I don't think you can look at 51 uh, or two Democrats or 48 uh, Republicans in the, in the uh, Congress or in the Senate, rather. I don't think you can paint them all with one brush. Uh, I, I think there's still going to be divisions uh, within the parties, and therefore I think governing is going to continue to be difficult. So while I know hopes are high uh, on the left uh, and, and concerns are high on the right, if you will, uh, I actually think we're going to see more of the same once we perhaps get past a little bit of this honeymoon. You know, to just add on to a little bit of that, um, I think probably to your point, the most significant thing right now to watch is going to be what is the organizing resolution of the Senate? How How is it going to made up, be made up? How are they going to function? The speaker, and I know you were listening on the previous session, but the speaker before uh, in the interview with Sarah Wyant uh, talked about in a 50-50 Senate how one Senator Manchin, he used as an example, could pull a Jim Jeffords and switch parties. Interestingly enough, when you look at the ideological scale of conservative to liberal, uh, Manchin is more conservative than three Republican senators, but right behind those Republican senators are a few Democrats that are from typically Republican states that are somewhat conservative in their nature, the most conservative, the Democratic caucus. And I think that leads to this question about the power of the middle. Do you see um, the opportunity for collaboration of the middle, or are you a little bit less pessimistic, or a little bit less optimistic, if you will? Right. Well, I think you, I think you, you pointed, you said that at the end because you probably actually know what I think, and this may be uh, where we could disagree a little bit. And I know the audience would love that if we uh, called each other names and uh, and yelled at each other a little bit. But you know, I, I heard this illustration a few weeks ago. And as much as it troubles me, I actually think it's correct. And that is that maybe 15, 20 years ago, if you looked at the spectrum that you just talked about, that most conservative to, to most uh, progressive or liberal, whatever word you want to use, uh, you did find that most of the folks in Congress were bunched around the middle. Uh, based on the statistics that I've seen and the voting patterns and what people have said during their campaigns, I actually think those two, that nucleus has divided and moved apart, that we have more of what looks like a dumbbell uh, than a coalescing around the middle, more of a more of a barbell, if you will, than a coalescing around the middle. So while I do think there's folks in the middle that if they are willing to move the other way just a little bit, they'll have tremendous power. I think it's going to be more the ends attracting someone out of the middle as opposed to the middle tr attracting folks out of the end, if, if that makes sense. And I think that's the big unknown, isn't it, about, you know, what actually happens. And I, I would offer that I think the first big case study is going to be on the COVID relief package. I think there's a lot of folks that think it's a foregone conclusion that we're going to have a bill that's $1.9 trillion. And I would offer, I'm not so sure that's the case, that it's going to be that much. And, you know, how does this all, you know, peace, love, sing together, how does it work? And we're going to know, I believe, in the next 30 to 45 days. So let's go towards engagement for just a moment. Obviously, the world has changed. Um, we are not um, advocating in the traditional sense. But in this environment, um, would you offer a few thoughts on advocacy towards our audience in terms of if it's still needed, how is that best work, um, um, any, any insights? And I would also uh, offer up one more time, if you have a question, this is your last chance to, to get it in. So. Put down your forks for those of you that are eating there at the house and send in a question. Ray, go. I'm impressed if there's anybody actually using a fork. When I'm eating at home by myself, it's usually just stuffing uh, stuffing something with my hands in my face. I've got this dairy crowd's probably more. 
on silverware. Go ahead. <laughs> this dairy crowd is probably more refined than, uh, than than I am. Yeah, on advocacy, great question. And I, you know, I think the right thing for me to say here is yes, it's important to be engaged and to stay involved. But I want to go. Uh, I want to go a step further than that, and and to say that you know, part of divided power, or part of uh, new folks being in office, which again is what our system provides for, is figuring out the way to work with them. Uh, I, I, you heard my skepticism before about the new green economy uh, and all the ways agriculture was going to lead on climate change. I mean, I do think there are some opportunities there, but I think we're going to have to be careful to see what those sticks that I mentioned are. Uh, but Michael, you, you do a great job there. You, you, there's you know, it's generally not a door you can't walk through uh, in Washington. Uh, but let's be honest, the best way the most effective way to continue to impact that conversation in Washington is for members of EDGE to get a congressman or a senator or even a staffer to get them in their pickup for about 30 minutes, to get them on that farm, to walk through, to build a relationship, to be able to have someone on the other end in Washington that answers your calls. And I'm going to say something that's probably a little untraditional for a speaker, but I've worked on campaigns and I know how difficult it is to get your message out there. The ag community has got to support candidates that support the ag community. And by that, I mean, we've got to write checks. Uh, we've got to be willing to help the politicians that are willing to take our message out. Uh, we've got to be willing to help them stay in office. Uh, I think all those parameters, notwithstanding COVID, notwithstanding the gavel changes, none of that has changed. It is still about perception. It is still about relationships. Uh, and it's still about making investments of time. So, so don't become cynical. Uh, don't be worried. Uh, I think at the end of the day, as Americans, we still have more in common, regardless of our parties, than we do that we disagree on, uh, which again may sound a little cliche, but I think that's what we need to hear uh, here is that there's definitely a way to influence this conversation, Michael. Um, Ray, the questions have come in now, and thank you for that insight, because I couldn't agree more that if ever there was a time to be advocating. That's exactly right. That be it. And, but this goes to a question. The folks in the upper Midwest are pretty familiar with this litigate, litigation aspect of, of your presentation. And, you know, they've been working um, with the environmental community under this umbrella of, I guess, the descriptive word would be collaboration, trying to find, find ways to work together. But you've also got a lot of folks um, on the other side of the aisle that know that rural America didn't support this president in large numbers. And the questions that I'm trying to kind of weave together here, I mean, does agriculture, because they've actually been working on this in a proactive way, are they going to have any credibility with this administration? Can you give them hope that their efforts and their work will, um, will be acknowledged um, as these folks work through their own process of rulemakings and legislating? Yeah, well, I think that old phrase, trust but verify, uh, probably applies here. But look, what we've heard from the new administration is about unity uh, and coming together. And so I think at least for the first few weeks, months, and hopefully if they earn it uh, the years, uh, we're going to we're going to hold their feet to the fire. I think perhaps the to, to create some of that unity and to give us some of that atmosphere. I think perhaps that concern overlooks the fact that the folks in power today got back there by appearing to be uh, more connected with the suburbanites and understanding some of those rural challenges a little bit more. Now, the numbers definitely show that rural America overwhelmingly voted for Trump, but there were certainly pockets throughout the country where Democrats made gains. Those pockets ended up being the pockets that mattered. And so I think the lesson on the political side is we do need to work with these folks and we do need to understand what their needs and desires are and figure out how to communicate with them. Uh, so I, I don't think all hope is lost. Uh, but to that litigation point, you know, sort of again, weaving a couple of things together. Uh, one of the other things we ought to mention, Michael, is it's not only appointments, uh, it's not only executive orders uh, or memorandum of understanding between agencies, but a lot of the Trump administration regulatory agenda did end up in court. Many of those cases are still pending, which means that a new DOJ, a new EPA, and a new USDA will end up litigating the remainder of those cases. It doesn't take a, a Harvard lawyer to understand uh, they're going to settle some of those cases because they actually agree with the party that sued the government now. 
that's a sue and settle tactic, uh, which, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether that ought to be allowed. Uh, but one question I would ask us in ag, if there's something that's really important that was accomplished over the last four years as a part of the regulatory agenda, are we prepared to jump in to intervene and to defend it if we figure out that the United States federal government isn't going to do that? That's the kind of apparatus, that's the kind of tool, that's the kind of uh, capability that I think we're missing that I think the other side has. All right, I don't, we're gonna have to talk fast, real fast. Immigration and minimum wage, do you have a short answer? We get an immigration bill and do we increase the minimum wage $15? I think you get an immigration bill. I do not think it solves our H-2A or our dairy uh, year-round labor problems. And anything, any sign of minimum wage? Is it going to go? Well, I think that the challenge with minimum wage in the Senate is you really can't do it without, um, without you can't do it in reconciliation. So again, unless the rules change, you're going to have to do it with 60 votes. And I think that's highly unlikely, at least early on. Yeah. Uh, folks, uh, thank me or help me thank <laughs> Great. <laughs> I got a whole thing about love you, love me. In this thank you, Mark. Great. Thank you for the time, you your insight, and all, all of you out there, thank you for um, being a part of this program. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate our sponsors. Look forward to seeing you all again. Yeah. Thank you.